Hello, everyone. I will get started in a couple of seconds, just waiting for everybody to start um, in, a, in a minute, probably. Oops. Okay, I have 101 and we're getting started. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm Paz Artaza Regan. I'm program manager at Catholic Climate Covenant and I will be moderating today's webinar. And today's webinar is the first in a series of webinars where the Covenant will be inviting diocesan staff volunteers that have been working on Laudato Si for quite some time uh, and asking them to explain how they got started in this work, how their archdiocese diocese uh, came to this type of uh, effort. Uh, and we are going to be trying to really be expansive as to how we present. Today we have presentations from two champions, uh, early champions is what I call them, uh, the Archdiocese of Atlanta and the Archdiocese of Chicago. And the inspiration for the, these webinars, the series, is the constant question that we receive, how do I get my diocese to work on Laudato Si? And this series will really try to illuminate and give us tips and ideas of how to do that. Uh, as we get started, uh, I always have a little bit of housekeeping. And the webinar is being recorded and the recording link will be sent within the next 24 to 48 hours to everybody who has registered. The chat feature can be used to communicate with others on the webinar. Do note though that the chat feature is not saved at the end of the webinar by participants. For questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A box uh, that's available. If you know the question uh, to whom it's directed to, please add that uh, so that I, when I ask the questions, I know who to send the question to. Um, let us get started. Uh, we always start um, our webinars with a prayer. Uh, today we are celebrating, of course, the anniversary of Laudato Si. It is Laudato Si week, and seven years ago, Pope Francis uh, published, made public the, uh, Laudato Si. So we're commemorating a very special anniversary with this webinar. And in order to uh, get us started, we chose the prayer, the common prayer that the Vatican has chosen for this uh, occasion. Uh, so if you would please center yourself, remember that God is always in our presence. Loving God, creator of heaven and earth and all that is in them, you created us in your own image and made us stewards of all your creation. You blessed us with the sun, water, and bountiful land so that all might be nourished. Open our minds and touch our hearts so that we may attend to your gift of creation. Help us to be conscious that our common home belongs not only to us, but to all of your creatures and to all future generations, and that it is our responsibility to preserve it. May we help each person secure the food and resources that they need. Be present to those in need in these trying times, especially the poorest and those most at risk of being left behind. 
transform our fear and feelings of isolation into hope and fraternity so that we may experience a true conversion of the heart. Help us to show creative solidarity in addressing the consequences of this global pandemic. Make us courageous to embrace the changes that are needed in search of the common good. Now more than ever, may we feel that we are all interconnected and interdependent. Enable us to listen and respond to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. May the present sufferings be the birth pangs of a more fraternal and sustainable world. Under the loving gaze of Mary, help of Christians, we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I have the honor and pleasure to be joined today with really what I would call Laudato Si champions. Uh, these two archdioceses probably stepped up very early in the, probably 2015, 16 is when they really started working on Laudato Si. Both archdioceses were chosen by the Vatican to be represented in the Laudato Si action platform as part of the parishes and diocese working group. So I am really, you know, excited to be welcoming here uh, from the Archdiocese of Atlanta, Susan Varlamov and Brian Savoy, and from the Archdiocese of Chicago, Michael Terrian, Cindy Kramer, and Tony Quintanilla. In order to save time, I will be sharing in the chat the speakers, presenters, uh, bios in a minute or two, uh, but we're going to get really right into the uh, program. So I am going to stop sharing and I am going to invite Susan and Brian to start us off with how the Archdiocese of Atlanta came to do this work, how it came to, you know, what propelled it, how you did it, and to give us tips uh, as to how we would do this if we were in a, our own Archdiocese or diocese. Susan, you're muted. Hello, everybody. I'm thrilled and honored to be to participate in this webinar. Um, and I'm going to dive right in because we began many years ago, six years ago, and we have a lot of information to present. But I want to make it clear that what occurred in Atlanta began really as a grassroots movement and continues as a bottom-up movement in which we convinced the archdiocese fairly recently to put resources into a program that a group of us developed based on an action plan we wrote for Pope Francis and environmental encyclical Laudato Si. And honestly, I've been involved with grassroots movements before, and this is really the best way to lasting success when people embrace it from the bottom. However, it's very difficult to go from a vision to developing a program that can be duplicated by others. And as, we, and as far as we know, we were the first in the nation to do this and the world to develop a program for Laudato Si to impact climate change and other environmental challenges we currently face. So why did we do it? Well, we believed in our heart of hearts that the Catholic Church, which one, with 1.3 billion faithful, led by Pope Francis, who studied to be a chemist, that we can be a change agent for climate change. Scientists tell us that with only 3.5% Catholics adopting practices to impact climate change, we can make progress on this issue. And we feel that we can at least begin that in Atlanta. So no one forced me to approach Archbishop Gregory and ask what I could do to help Pope Francis uh, with his encyclical. I knew ahead of time it was coming out. He laughed and he said, you know, um, you can't really participate in that. It's an inside job. But he said, we really could use an action plan for Georgia. I want to say that um, my pastor, Father Sonny, gave me the entree into the archbishop. Um, the archbishop did not write it. Um, they did not oversee it. They placed their trust in a group of University of Georgia scientists 
of various faiths and disciplines to do the job. Now the Yale program on climate communications did a survey of Americans and learned that 70% believe in climate change, but they don't know what to do. So this action plan has the actions that they can take to make an impact. So we decided, you know, how, how do we begin here? We decided to begin with the low hanging fruit, which we felt was energy efficiency and reduction. So we began with energy audits and upgrades um, and we helped parishes and school write grants to achieve these upgrades. Archbishop Gregory said, if you can help a pastor reduce the cost of, run, of running his operation, his parish, he'll want to work with you. The Archdiocese, however, did help select the parishes in these early days and even twisted a few arms to work with us. This is very hard work. We are going parish to parish, school by school, convincing them to try to work with us to reduce water, energy, waste, and many other things. And there is no other way as a biologist, as a scientist, to impact climate change and to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. Um, and then by reducing our reliance on fossil fuels and then planting vegetation to absorb carbon dioxide. So through this action plan in our program, we are doing much more. So let me begin. So in, in June, 2015, Pope Francis released Laudato C. We responded again, Archbishop Gregory suggested we do an action plan. My colleague, a geologist, Dr. Rob McDowell, and I wrote this action plan. It was reviewed by our colleagues of various faiths and disciplines. Um, it was released April 4th at the University of Georgia Catholic Center, which was just fabulous. All the scientists were present, which if you can get a group of scientists together on one day at one time, it was miraculous. Two to 300 people attended, including many school children, sisters, and priests from throughout the archdiocese. You will see as we do this, we try to um, celebrate what we do. It keeps us going. Okay, so this was the kickoff. And these were some of the speakers. Um, you see, I'm in the middle. Archbishop Gregory is to my right. On his right is Dr. Marshall Shepard. He is a climate scientist who is a member of the Academy of Sciences, Arts and Sciences and Engineering. He wrote one of the chapters. To my left is Reverend Gerald Durley. He is a civil rights activist who worked with Martin Luther King. He said the climate change is a civil rights issue of our time. And to his left is a environmental activist. So what is in this action plan? Well, we began with a Judeo-Christian tradition of care for God's creation because that was in the original uh, Laudato Si. And then we have 10 chapters, menu of actions aligned with issues from Laudato Si, rated easy, moderate, and advanced that parishes and parishioners can take. Many local resources are listed. For example, how do you set up a recycling program? You have those resources. And finally, in the conclusion, a call to action by Archbishop Gregory. The Catholic Church, of course, is a spiritual organization. So we begin in prayer, the cancel of the sun of the, and the action plan. We end in prayer, a prayer for the earth. And we are, it's bookended by a call to do this in love. The person that did the layout for this action plan, that was his idea. And it's perfect. These are the chapters. These chapters are listed in the order that we would try to bring people into our program, engage them. Then, as we said, conserve energy, water, recycle, buy and share food thoughtfully. We know that food can cause a lot of CO2 emissions if it's not um, produced correctly, if we eat too much meat, for example. So that carries a lot of weight, makes smart mobility choices, Use land sustainably. There is so much land that in Georgia that surrounds these Catholic churches. And if we can be planting trees and vegetation and using native plants, that will make a difference. Embracing environmental justice and equity, advocating for the earth and the vulnerable, 
and adapting it for young people. Um, this is the second iteration of our action plan cover um, it, with a tremendous emphasis on more environmental justice. Um, you'll notice that we are acting locally, but we're thinking globally. These children represent the cultures of humanity and um, they're trying to hold, of course, a broken earth. So what was our strategy in doing this? Again, not all of these scientists were Catholics, but they all respected Pope Francis. So we felt we wanted to harness the power of the pulpit. In Georgia, everybody's in church on the weekends to offer practices that churches, synagogues, temples, and their faithful can use to care for creation and one another, to offer actions so that everyone, regardless of their resources and skills, can do something, to offer local resources to implement the practices, to create a replicable model for other archdioceses and faiths to follow, and to have the church serve as a demonstration site for the community in creation care. So the action plan was disseminated by the archbishop. He sent hard copies to all the parishes and to all the US bishops in the United States. Um, he also, I also began to send it out to my friends. I've been involved in the environmental movement since I was very young. And so I know the movers and shakers and philanthropists. So I sent it out to them and lo and behold in 2017, which is really less than a year after we released it. Rutherford Seidel, he's the son-in-law of Ted Turner. He offered to fund a pilot project. So the funding covered a part-time program manager uh, and energy audits for 12 churches and schools. Brian was that program manager, brings tremendous skills and having a point person to organize this made all the difference. It wasn't just people Parish is trying to figure out what to do, when to do it. Okay, so the first adopter was my church, of course, because um, I wrote this action plan. And so I am there with Father Sonny from India. He thought it was a great idea because he lives in India where their regulations are not too stiff, environmental regulations. And so I want to emphasize the way I got volunteers is very simple. I got up at mass and asked, told people what we were doing and asked for help. 45 people registered. And the amount of talent was, I couldn't believe it. So to my to Father Sonny's left is an EPA um, director of solid waste management recycling. Behind him, Brian, was enormous experience in program management. Uh, to his right, a CDC, um, he was high in the ranks of the CDC and helped write grants. To his right is the agricultural extension agent. To his, to his right is uh, Susan Eubanks, a lot of uh, experience in organic agriculture and food services. Then there's Mary. She has tremendous experience in communication, videography, and then Deca Mike. So in five years, here's what we accomplished. Actually, I was bowled over when I saw these numbers. So five years, one parish reduced greenhouse gases by 38%, reduced waste by 50% reduce water by 70%. But most important to Father Sonny, reduce the cost of maintaining the parish by $9,000 a year. We did many other things. We had an archdiocesan retreat. We use sustainable landscaping, we recycle, we wash dishes for small receptions and we host creation care lectures. I wanna also point out that in when you have people that really want to do this work, it's important that they be recognized for the skills they have and let them propose what they can do and want to do. For example, one example, someone said, I'm sick of the garbage that is um, after these big receptions that we have. She said, we need to wash dishes. We have the dishes, so that's what we do. Okay, so here's where I turn it over to Brian. Uh, whoops, excuse me. Um, after we convinced the archdiocese to help out, they decided they would help fund two sustainability coordinators that are in this picture, Brian to the far left and then in the center, Leonard. The skills these two men bring is extraordinary. And of course we have our intern. So, and Kat Doyle, who 
is the liaison to the Vatican from Atlanta. So I'm going to let Brian take this now. Brian, you're muted. Okay. I am coming right on. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I apologize. Uh, I had planned this to be outside and lo and behold, the lawnmower just started on the lawn next to me. So I've had to move back inside. But um, to transition from Susan, I wanted to mention that the picture you see in front of you is today's picture. It's not the picture that we had in 2016. The picture that we would have been able to show you in 2016 would have been about one eighth of me and about one quarter of Susan. So we've come a long way in terms of people working on this part-time, uh, heavy part-time, et cetera. And that's what you see in front of you. But one of our little lessons learned or guidance to you is gather who you can get and start small. And that's really the only message I wanted to leave here. This is where we are today with three or four or five part-time people, including an intern from Crystal Ray High School. But, uh, but that's not where we started. We started with just a little bit of time from Scrappy Susan and me at a Starbucks coffee shop near her home. So let's move to the next slide. As Susan mentioned, one of the first things we did was uh, we thought big, we had multi-year plans and projects, but we said we must start small. And so we did start small with just 12 parishes and schools enrolling in an effort to only look at energy uh, and water usage, just those two things, just 12 churches and schools with the idea of reducing those by about 25%. Uh, and so moving to the next slide, you can see some of the results. Uh, in addition to helping those churches and schools meet those goals, and they have mostly met those goals now, the initial improvements they saw were 16%, 15%, 20%. But uh, after doing a few more of the projects, most of them have reached those 20, 25% numbers on water and energy, and, uh, and some have exceeded it tremendously. The other things that happened with this pilot project were not specifically tied to those churches and schools. It was about uh, gaining momentum and, and gaining involvement. Uh, we touched directly 50 people, impacting 8,500 people at 11 different sites. We also inspired funding and pro bono work for that phase and the next phase, including $34,000 of energy efficiency grants from Georgia Interfaith Power and Light, uh, donated time from attorneys, uh, donated time from people like me, frankly, uh, in addition to the early monies. Uh, end result across these 12 or so parishes and schools, close to $10,000 LED light change outs, 50% reduction in certain instances, such as the gym at St. Mary's Catholic School. Next slide, Susan. Looking back now from six years and looking backwards, the things I would say have been, have been important to us to making this work is one, respecting the practice of solidarity that the church practices. And for this effort, that means expecting everyone to contribute in some way, time, talent, and or treasure. And we, we live by this in everything we do within ourselves and our own work and how we work with the parishes and schools. Susan? Uh, next is subsidiarity. And that is basically having the leadership and decisions work at the lowest possible and the most local level possible. And we can translate this to working with those who are ready, willing, and able. If a pastor's not ready, we're not twisting his arm. If they can't find a creation care team leader, we probably won't go there. We're working with those who are ready, willing, and able with no forcing from the top, with the exception of maybe the very beginning of asking for volunteers. And that's working really well. Right now we have people calling us asking to sort of enroll in our program. Uh, we have to send out an invite, but we're getting lots of responses. Next. The other thing we would say looking back is, uh, just try to find a little bit of seed money and seed personnel, some part-timers and some money to get started. Uh, as we've moved forward, we've really developed a, uh, a multi-pronged approach to, to personnel, to funding, things like archdiocese staff, interns, students, professional services that are discounted, uh, help from partner organizations, and same on the fundraising. Uh, we've pressed every, every, turned every stone from the archbishop 
to individual parishes and schools when we engage with them, to large and small donors. Uh, I give Catholic. We're looking at an, an all out uh, approach on encouraging fundraising in the parishes and schools as well as at the archdiocese level. And so to give you one example, uh, we had a donor donate funds for the energy audits. Well, Gipple, Georgia Innovate Power and Light matched that with low cost audits, half price audits. The parish saw these savings, then a parishioner donated some money, Gipple donated a matching grant, Georgia Power Company donated a rebate, so some schools and churches practically got LED changeouts for free, at least as they saw it. And so uh, there is a virtuous cycle here going that we've seen with funding and personnel resources. Next. Uh, we couldn't have done this without partners and experts who were willing to work for discounted prices or in some cases free. You see some of them there ranging from EPA using Energy Star Portfolio Manager as a tool to water auditor volunteers from the US Green Building Council. And then we even had a renewable energy attorney volunteer to review any solar contract that we came up with. So there, and lastly, I'll mention the new action plan issued in 2021. Uh, heavily involved the Archdiocese Communication Director and staff uh, in not in writing it, but in publishing it and getting it printed and those kind of things. And we could not have done it without their expertise. Yeah. So don't be afraid to ask experts for help and definitely tap what partners and collaborators can offer. Next. Uh, another guidepost we've had is to have a bias for action. Our pilot project in 2017 ended up turning into a seven year, seven to 10 year program called the Laudato Si Initiative for the 2020. We had 12 parishes and schools in 2012, in 2017. We'll have 36 by the end of this year involved in this program. We had six authors on the initial action plan. We've had 23 contribute to the 2021 plan. So our perspective, I suppose, is that Get out there and do it, and people will join you once they see you doing it. The other thing I'll mention is that it sounds uh, cliche, but success does breed success. Mentions in the media get us more resources. More resources are usually early adopters, which inspires more participation. Uh, we had one part-time program manager in 2017. Now we have four part-time members in 2022. So if you take action, Others will follow and jump in. That's been our takeaway on that. Next. Um, everywhere we can, we encourage the inclusion of prayer and spiritual and liturgical activities. And you can see some of the examples there. The one I'll mention in the picture is a new prayer garden at Holy Family Catholic Church, built in a forest behind the church, built primarily by Boy Scouts and the Life Team Group with the gardening ministry volunteers, and to boot, they used statues that were recycled from another church that had closed. So it just really completed the loop on who you could involve, what you can do, and, and what materials you can use to do it. Uh, we also have a green mass every year that gets better and better each year. Next. Don't forget to set at least a few quantifiable goals. In this case, these are energy reduction charts. And if anyone's familiar with the Energy Star uh, scoring of zero to 100, 100 being great. We've had churches and schools move from scores from like 29 to 41 in two years, or from 50 to 75 over two years. So by measuring, we're able to give people attaboys and also see real progress in a pretty short time. Next, uh, as we form this larger effort in 2020 called the Laudato Si Initiative for Atlanta, we did step back and actually define a mission and goals and objectives. I won't cover all these here except to say, we are thinking big. It's, it's the whole archdiocese. It's 120 plus parishes and schools, and 400 buildings and 5 million square feet of space on 2000 acres and another 2000 at a monastery. So we're looking broadly, but focusing on a bit at a time. Next. And then you'll see some of our objectives here. It's quite a range. The ones in red are the most tangible. Uh, but we are focusing on all, all of them. These red ones are the initial ones that we've talked about so far, including greenhouse gas reduction, 
uh, landfill waste reductions by 50% and water and energy that we've spoken about already. So objectives, Susan. Don't hesitate to try to put together a realistic timeline with a work plan and resource estimates. When you do this, the numbers will blow you away at how big this can be. But it's, I think it's best to be honest about how long this might take, how many volunteers and paid people it might help, might need, how many, how much, in our case, 120 energy audits costs, those kinds of things. We've built our seven-year plan, really more like 10, to, uh, to roll the entire Laudato Si action plan out across what we believe will be 80% of the parishes and schools in the archdiocese. We're hoping for 100% involvement. We probably won't get it. So 108 out of 128 is our goal with the idea of each parish and school probably going through about a five-year effort themselves from beginning to end to bring in all 10 aspects of the Laudato Si action plan that apply to them and a seven to 10-year effort for the archdiocese overall. Next. Uh, this is looking back an encouragement to you just to say, we've been at this six years already. And we're really just turning now a corner that has a new archbishop on board, a brand new action plan in place, a team of four, about half time people, um, funding starting to, to come in a little more readily than just the bootstrap funding we had in the beginning. So it's taken us six years to get to this point. And frankly, our seven to 10 year plan began right in the beginning of COVID. So we see that seven to 10 year plan really beginning, let's call it 2020, 2021. So it's in effect through 2030. Next, and we're almost done on my part. Here are some accomplishments from last year. I won't go into them in great detail, except to say we built that plan. We continued on energy audits and things like that and continued to enroll more churches and schools in this program and continued to work on the media front to get out into places like Inside Climate News and National Catholic Register. And we were even lucky enough to get some time with NPR. Thanks, Susan. So looking forward, what's up for 2022 and beyond? We did just finally get a press release from the Archbishop about the action plan and implementing it um, or increasing resource availability where we can. Some of that's tied to funding, some of that's tied to volunteers. Uh, we're re-engaging with the 2017 and 2020 cohorts that didn't fall away, we fell away during COVID a bit. We're re-engaging with them this year and certainly working to regrow our funding efforts as well as uh, looking very, very seriously at a number of solar energy opportunities in the archdiocese. So that's 2022 and beyond. And Susan, back to you. Voice, Susan. So when we got the news from the Vatican that we were selected as a model uh, for the country, um, uh, I invited her to my house to have a uh, local food potluck, and we are toasting with St. Francis wine sustainably produced. The arch, the bishop is on the right, and of course, Father Sonny, that is our team. Um, we do a lot of parties because it's a tough job we're doing. So in the end, why are we doing this really? And um, we're doing it for the next generation. Um, Pope Francis says, what kind of world do we want to leave for our children? It's up to us, we're in charge and succeeding generations hopefully will follow. Those children are walking into the future. Those are my grandchildren. They're much older now into a future that we leave them. And so my, I will dedicate my days to doing this work. And a very wise Hopi Indian chief said, we are the ones we are waiting for. So it's up to us. And that's our presentation. Thank you. One Thank more you. slide. If <laughs> We can be of help to anyone. Uh, this, these are our contact information. Thank you, Susan. I will include those emails in uh, the email that goes out with the recording uh, so folks have it. But thank you so much. Uh, at this point, we will move to Chicago. So Susan, if you could stop sharing your screen. That, perfect, thank you. Uh, 
the great thing about having both Atlanta and Chicago presenting is that I do believe that they are very different models of how to get into the Laudato Si work. Uh, Atlanta chose to go through an action plan and Chicago is doing some remarkable things with a different kind of approach. So I'm going to that now pass it on to Chicago. Uh, Michael, I believe maybe you go first, but you decide how your group is going thank, to present. Thank you, Paz and Susan and Brian. Thank you for your amazing work. What a blessing. Thank you, thank you. And friends, I am in the middle of COVID. So I've rallied myself out of bed and I'm operating on about three cylinders, but we're here with my colleagues, Tony and Cindy, and we're in this together. And so we'll just begin to share, uh, I guess, but the, the first part is how did we get involved in this? Um, like Susan, the Archdiocese of the Encyclical was promulgated, we began to look at how do we bring this into life in the, in the diocese. Um, and, but I just, I'd like to fast forward. Um, in, with Susan in Atlanta, the presentation was very focused on um, energy and, um, and, and how that fits within the church and that environmental piece, and that's so critical. Um, and Laudato C um, is within the context of an integral ecology. And so an integral ecology includes everything. It includes, I mean, that's it. It includes everything. And it recognizes that everything is connected. And that's basically, and that everything is a gift from God and everything returns to God. And we are creatures and we are part of nature. And we're here to love God and to love our neighbor. And included in that is loving this beautiful planet and all of the cosmos in which we were part of. <clears throat> so I'd like to just step back a second and say how this be began. There was a conversation that I was having with some folks at the Vatican and we were looking at um, actually different scenarios and COVID began to break out. And one of the things that I saw um, Johns Hopkins doing was how they had a, uh, a dashboard and how they were uh, being able to monitor and calibrate what was going on around COVID. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So we just further conversations. And so, and then there was another conversation pause. I forget where it was, but they said, you know, we're starting to put together something around this idea. And if you're interested, let us know, or we'd like to have a conversation with you about that. And we said, okay. So we received a, um, an email. And then we began to look at how do you design this platform and what's its purpose and how is it going to be organized? So we did a, some focus groups. And specifically in Chicago, um, we did a focus group within the Latinx community and the African-American community, um, two different uh, populations. And it was clear that the pain and suffering in their communities in terms of with the Latinx community with COVID and it just shattering their economy, their healthcare, their sense of community, their um, families and violence and everything was just breaking apart. The threads were coming apart. And then with the whole situation with Black Lives Matter and the African-American community, they were angry. And, and they were, you know, like, why should we trust you? <laughs> um, and in both of those scenarios, it was really clear that <clears throat> they it's great to talk about the environment. It's great about, but when your house is on fire and your world is coming apart, you're just trying to put out the fire. And it was really clear that community needed to be a big part of what the Dr. Action Platform was about. And how do we create a platform where people feel connected and listened to, and valued, and cared for. 
And how does that relate to the connection to all of the rest of creation as well into this universal communion? So <clears throat> then we began to springboard into the actual work of the platform and looking at the designs and the questions and the matrix and all of the different goals and the activities under the goals. <clears throat> and how do you concretize those elements? <clears throat> But the, the challenge with that, it's like broccoli. You begin to get down into the weeds and those weeds are important, but then you lose the, pic, the big picture. So both of those need to be held at the same time. In most dioceses and most parishes, they're like the same attitude with those community groups, that those focus groups that we did. It's great to talk about this, but how can we do this? when our neighborhood is smattered, when my parish is losing parishioners, when we don't have any money, when um, there's not enough priests and the priests are burnt out and my bishop is trying to just deal with today. And we have all this pressure from the culture wars infiltrated the church. So we need to hear that and listen to that truth, all of those truths. So the approach has been, how do we approach this through our faith? How is this about evangelization? How is this about our relationship with Christ, our personal encounter with Christ, and how Christ is imbued in all of creation, including all human beings? So there's no separation. So then the focus became around evangelization and the Christology of what we're doing. Because otherwise we could just become the Sierra Club. And then the church goes, why are you talking to me about this? I just want to go to mass and have a nice liturgy and get on with my life. And so how do we open a way into that orientation? So from that, these objectives <clears throat> kind of underpin, if you will, the Laudato Si Action platform to evangelize the gospel. So we're leading with the gospel. And the second chapter of the Laudato Si is evangelizing the gospel of creation. So if you want to put evangelization, evangelize the gospel of creation, so be it. Inspiring witness to Jesus and living our faith through transformative action. So it all comes from our faith. Foster spiritual and ecological conversion, deepening our relationship with Christ. My belief in, is that climate change, loss of biodiversity, environmental degradation, and all those environmental things are a symptom of our separation. They're not so. We can go focus on climate change, and we need to. I'm not saying no. Yes, but what's underneath it? It's our separation, the sin. And so if we go back to our faith, then it's all born from that. And then ease the work and bridge gaps between parish ministries, committees, and AOC functions. So it's, again, it's connecting the dots as an integral whole, vertically and horizontally. And then this fourth one is really vital, a company. The idea of a company parishes and their LSAB journey and foster inter-parish networking within the local church. So now we're talking about a process where everything is connected. It becomes a self-organizing system. And then self-organizing systems occur through feedback and amplification. So it's recursive. The idea of our role is to accompany the parishes on the journey and foster this learning community between everyone in grounded in Christ and evangelization. And evangelization is you know, the good news of the gospel. <clears throat> and then building community and outreach with sharing parishes and Roman Catholic Church partners. Again, that going back to community, community. And invite and enrich parishioner engagement, including youth and young adults. So it's including everybody. It's not a separate 
entity over here, the green team, and then you got a group of people working hard on one specific thing, but to literally integrate the parish and then connect that with the universal church and everybody here. Because <clears throat> friends, this is hard work. I have five minutes. I was talking that much already. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you, pause. So real quickly, again, and you've probably seen these slides before, but the themes of the platform as an integral ecology are these seven pieces. The goals, they're right in line with those. The earth, the poor, economics, lifestyles, education, resilience. And then to invite everybody into that and to accompany them together in the process of synodality, solidarity, and subsidiarity. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Cindy and you could speak specifically in terms of how we're going about doing that with the parish as an accompaniment process. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna fast forward. We have a couple different uh, Laudato Si Action Platform committees. And uh, you'll hear me uh, saying, mentioning the words LSAP and that stands for Laudato Si Action Platform. So on our uh, LSAP Parish Committee, we meet weekly to collaborate on best practices to implement some of these materials that Michael has, sh has shared with you that we developed and focus on ways to support these peers champions in meeting with their pastor, forming an integral creation care committee with all of those different groups you saw listed there and how to effectively use the LSAP as a structural guide along this journey. So we recognize in this process that every parish is unique and our approach is Christ-centered, inclusive, welcoming, and solution-based from one parishioner to, or disciple, as you would, to another. We have found that when a creation care committee includes a variety of leaders from different ministries and staff from across the parish, together they can more effectively collaborate on discerning actions that respond to the goals of the LSAP as an integral whole of parish life. And this approach opens dialogue, builds bridges, increases evangelization in a very organic way. Eventually, the Laudato Si goals become woven throughout the parish community through initiatives, prayer, education, operations, Eucharist and liturgy, for example, all interconnected to caring for creation and the most vulnerable. In this process, our committee of uh, vicariate facilitators are focused on the importance of building relationships within each vicariate. We connect with our parish champions through regular engagement, sharing our Laudato Si materials, resources, events, uh, presentations that we bring to their parish, regular monthly Zoom meetings, and one-on-one -on -one or small group gatherings. The parish champions, excuse me, the parish champions are also building a network of creation care champions across the diocese where they can support each other as they work along the LSAP journey. We also keep open communication with our vicariate bishops who are supportive of this mission. Currently, we are engaged with over 30 parishes across our diocese and the enthusiasm is growing. It's been a learning curve for all of us as we, as we have encountered a wide variety of challenges along the way, which includes opening the lens that this is not just environmental, but very much social and important part of our Catholic faith. Being guided by Christ's example, together we share our gifts and persevere for our common home and future generations. At my parish, St. Anne Catholic Community in Barrington, we have, a, a, we have had wonderful ministries but never had a creation care committee. But last year, the Holy Spirit merged my parish, mer merged my path with a woman named Adrienne on the Faith Justice Ministry. And together we recognize the need uh, to bring the Laudato Si mission to our parish. As a former teacher, I saw an important piece of parish life was missing that should bridge with our school and young people and the rest of the parish community. And after many conversations, Adrian and I decided to begin with some small initiatives that included the school and faith formation students and families that could help break the ice and build a care for our common home bridge. We met with the school administration and discovered several of the teachers had embraced Laudato Si and were excited to do more. 
From there, as Creation Care Interest grew, we met with our pastor, where we shared some of the work we were developing at the Archdiocese in preparation for the launch of the LSAP. Although he was familiar with the Laudato C, he wondered about how this would work in our parish, expressed concerns about the reaction of certain pockets of parishioners who felt that environmental issues were only political, and how do we bring social and ecological conversion implications to life? So we started with um, our proposal, and I would begin leading in a study group of the encyclical, and together we would discern some steps along the way. At a next meeting, our pastor then encouraged us to form a creation care steering committee that would include representation from across various areas of parish life. And so our committee was born. Our committee began with our pastor, representatives from parish council staff, ministry leads, vice principal of our school, a parishioner, and a local retired retired Jesuit brother, uh, soon a young adult, a voice, and we have been able to solicit support from other parish uh, key stakeholders. So together, uh, along with this model at the Archdiocese, we have taken a deep dive into the Laudato Si Action Platform goals and action steps, which is the focus of our journey. We also recognize that although the urgency to act is critical, the reality was that we would have to build a foundation beginning with simple acts to spread community education and support. We meet twice a week to discern what we are currently doing in our parish community and decide what course of action and planning is needed uh, next looking forward. Uh, I, how is our time? Oh, I want to pass this over to Tony. So um, fast forward, um, we have had over 200 households commit to a pledge uh, to uh, volunteer and work together. And these acts of love have brought enthusiasm, hope, and opened the lens of being in communion with each other while making a difference for our common home. As the Archdiocese Chicago expands its creation care and, and LSAP efforts in this regard, I know in my heart, the Holy Spirit will continue to bring forward the champions needed for this mission, starting from wherever they are at. I encourage you all to visit the ARCH website at archchicago.org forward slash creation to find out more information and to see stories of how this is working in other parishes across our diocese. And we invite everyone to um, become involved. And I pass this to my colleague, Tony. Hi, everyone. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just focus on two key uh, examples. One is that um, Part of the Archdiocesan effort is to consolidate parishes. So uh, we've been working with parishes that are unifying. Uh, and actually, the Dallas the Action Platform effort has been a source of unity. We started with a unifying process of the LSAP and made that as an example of unity. So we're leading by action there. The other element I want to highlight is that um, many of our parishes have strong bilingual components. So we are making the materials available in a bilingual manner and approaching the presentations and efforts bilingually and also doing that special outreach to those communities. Um, so I think the, the in both cases, the, the stress is on outreach and inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, Cindy, Michael, uh, and I apologize that I had to be moving you along. Okay. I, I have cut the Q&A now to about six minutes. Um, one of the questions we've received, and I believe it can be answered by both archdioceses, is uh, what is a green mass? What is a season of creation mass? Uh, what, is, what did you mean by that? Um, Susan, do you want to sure. start with that one? We just had a green mass uh, last week. It was absolutely magnificent. Basically, um, it's a mass that honors and blesses the people who care for creation and work to protect it. <clears throat> and everything is, is surrounding that, including the music. Um, we, for the gifts brought to the altar, we brought gifts of the earth. We brought sunflowers in solidarity with Ukraine. We bought strawberries from a nearby farm. We brought um, lettuce that was grown for the pantry garden that we give to the poor. 
Um, we, the prayers for the faithful, again, were all geared toward um, caring for the earth. We also, Michael, believe in integral ecology too. And we weave that throughout our entire creation care. I mean, if you look at our um, action plan, we do a lot working with the poor. So um, that's the green mass after the green mass a reception of organic and locally produced food and flowers from the sustainable landscape. So if, it was, it was I, beautiful. If I could add just a comment or two, uh, all of the readings were done by people involved in creation care across the archdiocese. So we had people from, frankly, who started with us in 2017. We had people who had just joined the effort um, and had shown you know, progress within the last few months. So one part of that green mass was to not just have the, in our case, Bishop Kanzen offer that mass, but also tying it together with those who have already been working on creation care in the archdiocese. And uh, uh, of course, even the music and such was selected to match uh, the theme. So it's pretty complete from beginning to end and also another way to engage prayer and spirituality into the Laudato Si you know, actions uh, in a very tangible way and, and also live stream it and those kind of things to get to get it out that way to broadcast and promote the concept of tying in prayer uh, as part of the action in Laudato Si action. In Chicago, you also just had a mass um, or yes? Yeah, we just had it on Sunday, Cindy, Tony. Mm -hmm. And we can provide some information uh, as well. Yeah. Um, we'll post the, uh, the worship aid on our site. Perfect, thank you. Um, the other question I have here is, uh, when you got started, uh, how was all this creation care allowed out to see introduced to parishes and to priests? Was mm -hmm. it introduced by, because the cardinal, the archbishop said so? Was it bottom up? How did it happen? Yeah, I think uh, Brian really hit on this and so did Susan. The way this is, you, friends, we're in this together and it's lumpy and it's hard yeah. and it comes from the bottom up. Yep. If we're waiting for the bishops or waiting for them to give us permission, we just have to lean into it in solidarity. We're here for each other. Literally call us and we'll figure it out together. And it's perseverance, and the determination and trusting in the Holy Spirit. And there's all these barriers and you hit them and you go, okay, now what are we going to do? And there's a lot of different priorities and they're all being juggled at the same time. So the best, the, the most important message I can share on that is one, pray, ora et labora, you know, pray and work and do it together hand in hand. I, I, would, I would add, uh, while our initial efforts were a strong invitation from Archbishop and the Operations Center of VP of the Archdiocese, that was just an intro to talk with specific pastors. We literally provided uh, in a letter this as an opportunity for them to choose or not choose and try to explain what the advantages would be. Met with them and their staff uh, individually um, in person or, or via phone and talk through what their involvement might mean. It was a very personal, hand-on-hand, person-to-person uh, -person approach. And we're still applying that approach today. The, the latest cohort I'm inviting, will invite 20 parishes and schools to possibly get 12 or 14 in 2022. I sent out 10 personalized letters to those pastors and their staff a week ago, and I've gotten six responses so far. So the response rate is great if you take the personal, very personal approach, one at a time. Like that. Susan, do you have something? Yeah, Michael, it, Michael said it right. It, we're, it's patience, persistence. It is coming from the bottom up. What I have been shocked with, and probably you also, the amount of talent, the amount of interest in people wanting to do something to care for the earth. And so these people come forward to help in any way they can. And just as an example too, we encourage environmental justice. I personally went to stop the uh, expansion of a landfill in a poor community. We, work with the, we worked with the Vietnamese church to make sure there wasn't a landfill next to their uh, uh, property. I mean, so we're in it together. We're working together. We're using our skills for everyone. And um, 
it, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Also, I have calls all the time from people saying, I'm retiring. I'm dedicating my life to this work with you. Yeah. I mean, that's. I, I would love to continue, but it is two o'clock and I try to respect uh, everybody's time. I want to be able to thank the panelists for taking time to present today and to everybody who joined us. Be on the lookout for other webinars in this series where we will be looking at smaller dioceses, uh, dioceses that are perhaps not seen as um, far out left diocese. Uh, that, that is always an issue that I get saying, well, what do I do if my diocese is extremely conservative? There are dioceses that are extremely conservative traditional that are working on these issues. Uh, yeah. There is possibilities on this. So please uh, be on the lookout. And thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Peace. It's to be together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was great. Wonderful.